Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Take a few moments in silence to lay your burdens and your sins before your Lord. Most merciful God, we confess, confess that we are captive to sin and, and cannot free ourselves. We have, we have sinned, sinned against you in thought, thought word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have we not loved you with our whole heart. heart. We have we not, not loved, loved our neighbors, neighbors as ourselves. For the, For the sake, sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Christ have, have mercy on us. us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that, so that we, we may delight, delight in your will and, and walk, walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Response to the hungry and the poor. 
was rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. Glory, Glory to God in, in the highest. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Together, let us pray. You are great, O God, and greatly to be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you, know you, and serve you. Through your, your Son, Son Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, our, our Savior, Savior and Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, and we will be continuing with our readings. The coming messianic king will inaugurate an era of disarmament and prosperity. Because of God's covenant with Israel, the people are designated as prisoners of hope. Our first reading from Zechariah, the ninth chapter. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. 
as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today, I declare that I will restore you double. The word of the Lord. Life captive to you, to sin, is a catch-22. An extension in which we know good, but we do not do it, and do things we know to be wrong. Through Jesus Christ, God has set us free from such a futile existence. The second reading is from Romans 7. And as I read it this week beforehand, and knowing how long ago Paul wrote this, think about the words as we continue today to live them. From chapter 7, I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very same thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Sounds like Dr. Seuss sometimes. <laughs> now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. In the singing of the gospel acclamation. Gospel according to Matthew, the ninth chapter. Jesus spoke to the crowd, saying, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. 
Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Sisters and brothers in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. With three clicks of the ruby red slippers, And with a little prompting from the good witch, Dorothy repeats the mantra, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And then she leaves the technicolor alternate reality of the land of Oz, of that emerald city, and she is transported back home to Kansas in black and white, and kind of dirty and dusty, but it is home. That yearning for home is so strong that not even Technicolor and new interesting friends can compete for Dorothy. She wants home with family, with old friends, with neighbors, and Toto too. I think that yearning for home is really a universal truth. It's maybe not for everyone, but I believe it is, but maybe not. But most of us yearn for home. We we yearn for a place or a person that grounds us, that gives us an opportunity to know who we are, maybe not always who we can be, but who we are, and a place that tells us it's okay. We attach value and worth to that place, to that person, to the surroundings. Home can mean a new beginning, a new hope. Any of you who have ever worked on a Habitat for Humanity home can attest to that as you see people who are so excited for the very first time probably to have a place of their own, a place that they can call home, a place that they can make into their own place to be able to breathe and to live. For those of us who are fortunate enough to be able to buy a home too, that becomes this place of safety and security I think of all the homeless around the world wandering perhaps from night to night, wondering where in the world they are going to lay their head for that night. In this country, there's lots and lots of people. Around the world, there's even more. In war-torn countries, in the face of natural disasters, as immigrants and refugees who leave all behind just to seek a better place to raise their children and to live in relative safety, to call a place home. Now, of course, we know also that sometimes home is not a very comforting place. There are those for whom that is not a place that they even want to think about, and yet that's more of a house than a home, right? I think that that's the unfortunate thing. I think people always still yearn, even when they're in a desperate situation, they're still yearning for this place that they can, again, have a space to breathe and to call their own and to live in a relative peace. A few years ago, my husband and I were in Alaska, and we camped in a little place called Chicken. And perhaps some of you have been to Chicken, Alaska. It's an interesting little spot. And we were right next to a couple from California who had quite a large fifth wheel trailer, I mean really big. 
And we discovered in our conversation with these folks that they had sold their house in California, they bought this fifth wheel, and they really felt that with their purpose and their plan in life, and this fifth wheel, that this was a place and a, a time that they could really call home. This is where they were grounded in the trailer, in their purpose for life, for the travel. They were grounded there. They were really comfortable. I wonder whatever happened to them. I don't know if they went back to California. At some point, the fifth wheel would get awful small. <laughs> Today in our gospel reading, Jesus has been speaking to the crowds, people who are wondering who Jesus is. They're wondering who John the Baptist is. And Jesus is calling on those who are within earshot to pay attention, to pay attention to the new things that are happening as a result of John's teachings and as a result of the presence of Jesus, the events of healing, the events of liberating that are occurring in the name of Jesus, and the events of John as a voice in the wilderness calling out, come, repent, be baptized. Someone greater than I is coming, and oh, by the way, he is here. Jesus is saying to these folks, be open. And we have to say that today again in the church. Be open to some new things that are happening with God. Be open to these new experiences of God. Don't always toe the party line. What we've been told all throughout Sunday school and all those other places. Now I'm, I know I'm, I'm uh, seeding doubt here. <laughs> Hopefully not. But I want you to be open to the experiences of God, this God who comes to us in very different ways. We tend to go into that kind of narrow area. We say, oh, God can do this, but not this, because it doesn't fit with what I believe. Or God loves these people, but not those people, because that doesn't fit with what I believe. But God is so immense, so big. And Jesus is saying, look around. See what is happening. People are walking who never walked before. People are seeing who are blind. Something new is happening. In this discourse today that we hear from Jesus, he offers up a prayer. And in that prayer, he says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then Jesus invites everyone who is weighed down into that relationship, into the relationship with the Father and the Son, and we might say also the Spirit, into that relationship, into his actual heart, to find that home of peace and that home of rest. Come home. Come home. Take my yoke. And as you are yoked to me, I will walk side by side with you. That's what Jesus is saying to us. We'll work together, not alone. I will be your sanctuary, Jesus is saying, even when the way is rough. You'll learn from me, and you will find rest for your souls. There's no place like home. There's no place like home in Jesus. Scripture speaks to us of a God who in Jesus has chosen to dwell with us. The words in the Gospel of John is that Jesus has come to tent, to tent among us. In other words, he's here to live among us. Jesus makes his home with us so that we're going to see a God who is not far off, but who is here with us, in our midst, where two or three or more than that are gathered, and to whom we are eternally yoked through our baptism. We're reminded that Jesus tells his disciples, also this happens in John, 
Jesus tells them that there are many dwelling places in the house of his father and that he goes to prepare a place for them. And when he has done that, he will call them to himself. Come home. Jesus, here with us now, yoked with us forever, eternally. Come home. But even as we yearn for home, how often it is that we forget that Jesus is calling us, that Jesus is encouraging us to come to him with a promise of rest, of release from the burdens that we carry. We think about it, but then we have trouble translating that into action, taking those burdens, laying those burdens down. When we confess our sins, like we did with this morning, we lay those burdens down at the feet of our Lord. We give them up to our Lord. That's what this is. It's a promise of rest. It's a promise of release from all these burdens that we carry. I don't know how many of you still get the Living Lutheran magazine, but there was, in the latest edition, uh, someone who wrote something on this particular text, and she wrote that rest in Jesus is not about taking a nap. It's not about watching your favorite TV show without anybody talking to you during the good points. <laughs> that drives me crazy. <laughs> I love the blacklist, and Wayne talks to me during that. But nevertheless, this call from Jesus to lay down our burdens, to rest in him, is about being dependent on Christ, about resting in that life of Christ, resting in his death and in his resurrection. It's not always easy, perhaps, to live in that home in Christ, for we're called into a life that proclaims the love of God in word and deed. We're to go out with that knowledge, with that experience of God, and to give that to others to give that love to others. And in so doing, people of God, we ourselves are renewed. We are given hope, giving ourselves over to God so that despite what may happen, we can feel safe there in the arms of Jesus. We can feel loved and comforted as we live a life of death and resurrection. It's easy to become sidetracked. We get busy with life. We get stressed about life. We look around at a world that is broken and full of conflict, and we may despair. We may think that there is no relief on any horizon. We move away from God. We sometimes turn to other gods. It might be power, wealth, opioids, other drugs and addictive sources, politicians, doesn't matter. There's all kinds of gods out there. And whatever it is that seemingly would relieve the pain and the grief that may surround us, we move towards that. And invariably, and you know this too, because all of us have done that, invariably those other gods will disappoint us. And we may feel as if we are blowing in the wind without a tether to hold us. I think all disciples feel that way at times. And that's when we turn around and we begin again that quest for home. When I was very young, we had a Cocker Spaniel named Sparky. And I remember him, but only kind of vaguely because I was really young. But someone took him from our yard at some point and, couple, and a couple, three months after that, my folks got a call from somebody who lived about six blocks from us. And they had found a dog who they thought might be our dog because we had our description out there around the area. And so they called. And sure enough, my dad went to find out. And sure enough, it was Sparky. 
and his paws were ripped up, and he had some nails that were pulled out. He'd been clawing his way out of some place, and he was awfully skinny. We don't know where he had been held, but someone remembered that they had seen a dog when they were in Hibbing that was on Highway 169, <coughs> excuse me, walking towards Grand Rapids where we lived. There is no place like home. And there's no power that can stop that yearning and that quest and that movement. Now, I realize that we are not dogs here. Well, maybe Myrna. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Just a joke. Yeah. But we have a homing signal as well. We will come to Jesus battered and bruised as well, weary with all kinds of burdens. But his invitation stands for us to come now and forever into his heart of all hearts, to be at home with him. St. Paul reminds us, however, that our actions are still in opposition to God. And Dr. Seuss would have had it right. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. Opposition to God, moving away from home. But Paul ends our reading today with, in this letter to the Romans with these words, Who will rescue me from the body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how he ends that. And that's indeed where we finally have to stand this morning. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For Jesus not only invites our weary bones to come home, but he comes to us and gathers us in, for we cannot always do what we will. He gathers us in to himself, to the Father, forever, to grant us forgiveness to grant us respite, to grant us renewal in him. People of God, we're not going to rely on the ruby slippers, even though they're back now. And, and there is no good witch. But the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the great shepherd of the sheep is here today to bring us not to Kansas, but to the kingdom of God. Let our mantra always be, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There is no place like home in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand to join in the singing of our hymn? Yes. 
join together in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue now with the prayers of intercession. Each portion of the prayers will end with the words, Hear us, O God, and please respond, Your mercy is great. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, for those in need, and all of creation. God of the covenant, you call ministers to proclaim your gospel of grace throughout the world. Inspire pastors, deacons, church musicians, and all ministers of your word, as they carry out your work. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all creation, you reveal your goodness through all you have made, rivers and seas, plants and animals, and endangered species. Prosper the work of conservation organizations, botanical gardens, zoos, and wildlife sanctuaries. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of the nations, you desire that all the peoples of the world live in peace. Guide government leaders at all levels, national, state, provincial, and local, to work for justice, mercy, and reconciliation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of compassion, you bring healing to those who are sick, consolation to those who are grieving, and well-being to those who are distraught. Send skilled caregivers to all in need, especially those whom we now name out loud or in our hearts. Make your presence known among all who suffer. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of rejoicing, you have brought us together this day to worship around word and sacrament. Encourage children in their learning and growing, and watch over those who are absent today. Lead us all to places of renewal and refreshment. Lead us home. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all faithfulness, through the witness of the faithful departed, you reveal love in action. Embolden us by their example to build up the beloved community in all the contexts we encounter. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. And now into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please take a few moments to share a sign of peace with one another.
You may be seated as we have a time for offering. just play. Would you please stand? In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave it to his disciples, gave thanks, and said to them, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Would those who are serving communion please come forward to prepare. And for those of you who are worshiping online, now is the time to take the bread that you have gathered and eat it as you hear these words, the body of Christ given for you. And taking the wine or the grape juice, drink it as you hear these words, the blood of Christ shed for you. There will be two stations for communion. Come forward as you'd like. As you receive the words of blessing, choose between bread or a gluten-free cracker, and then choose between the red wine or the white grape juice. After communion, please place your empty glass in the wooden bowl on the side. As Conley said this morning, everyone is welcome to the table. We continue now with our communion. In this 
Would you please stand for the blessing? And now may the blessing of God and the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace, his truth, and his love forever. Amen. We continue with our next hymn. God. Glory to God. 